Welcome to the Standing in Her Power Global podcast. I'm absolutely delighted to uh, be speaking today to a phenomenal woman, um, a lady called Beatrice Arajo. Um, she is the Senior Counsel and Head of Corporate Governance at ba Baker McKenzie and has had a 35 year history of working for the firm in all sorts of arenas, uh, but particularly focusing on corporate law. Um, she's also um, a fellow of the World Economic Forum um, and um, has served as a member of the London Board's, uh, London Office's um, Management Committee, and also it has served a four-year term on the firm's Global Executive Committee. Her particular focus at uh, is currently is in ESG, but she's also led initiatives for Baker McKenzie in the arena of trust. Welcome, B. Hi, Penny. Lovely to see you and ha very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, obviously, you've had a phenomenal um, history in the legal profession but I'm fascinated to understand your background and um, your other interests as well um, for our listeners today. So shall we start with, um, tell me about your family and the environment in which you were brought up. So Penny, I'm, I'm the eldest of three children um, and actually had a, a, a brother and a sister, not twins, before I reached my third birthday. So grew up in a, in a very busy house, household. Um, my father was the breadwinner uh, and my mother chose uh, to raise us. So I guess a pretty typical um, upbringing when you're a, a baby boomer, I guess, born in the 60s. Okay. So, so, so busy times. Very good. And um, was it, would you say, was a happy childhood? Um, where, where were you? Which part of the world were you? In. Yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so very much a, in my memory, a very sort of happy childhood, easygoing childhood. We, I was born in uh, the US, uh, in Evanston, Illinois, near Chicago. We moved to Brussels sort of soon after my second birthday, I think. Uh, and then uh, around about my fourth birthday, we moved to Spain uh, and then uh, grew up there. Uh, if I see that as my formative years, sort of four to, to 14. I was then uh, sent to, to the UK to boarding school and I've pretty well been here ever since. But it was a pretty easy go lucky childhood. Spain was um, recovering still from the civil war, I guess. Um, we didn't have television for my early years. Um, uh, and um, so, so we're very much outdoors and um, enjoying life generally. Fantastic, but it sounds like a, a, a multinational um, yes, uh, background we were, when you were, when you were young. Do, I'm, sorry, sorry, Penny. <laughs> it's all right, no problem. Um, um, let me just deal sure. with something. Uh, just excuse me one second. Now. Of course, of course. Yes. no problem. So, B, it sounds like you had a very international experience as a, as a child and you took, you know, living in Brussels and then in Spain and then in England in your stride. Yeah, it, it just sort of, yeah, when you're a child, you just sort of go with the flow, as it were. So um, you, you, you moved around and that, that's what seemed normal. When I look back on, 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 on all of that, uh, what, what I think it's done is made me incredibly adaptable because you try, I think when it happens to you as a child, you're more likely to try to fit in uh, and be part of the environment you're thrown into. So it, it, it has made me more, um, I guess also more open-minded and I tend to listen more than talk to sort of get, get a sense of, reading the room what, what what's happening around me so it makes you your, your antennae I think are much more alert yeah very good yes it, exactly and also it strikes me that you must have been multilingual as a norm yes I, I was lucky because I was exposed to um 
actually before English um, to German, although my dad was American, my mother is German. And uh, even my dad uh, tried to speak German to me, so he then claimed I got too good for him. Then when we got to Brussels, um, because of the fact that uh, there were three very young kids in the house, as soon as I could be sent to some nursery or whatever I was sent, then that was in French. Uh, in my first year when we moved to Spain, I was actually at the French Lycée. Uh, and after that, without speaking a word of Spanish, I was thrown into a um, Spanish school, not, uh, uh, where I then spent 10 years. We, we also had help at home and she was Italian. So she didn't speak wow. a word of anything but Italian. <laughs> so yes, it kind of all built up in there. Somewhere in my brain, I have a lot of languages. Um, English being the one that I had to learn better. So that's why I came to, to, to the UK to school here when I was 14. Fantastic. Yeah, but what, what, what a heritage to have all those language skills and, and, that, and that experience. Um, no, it's great. It's, I'm very lucky. So what was um, life at, in, in uh, boarding school in England, presumably away from your family? Uh, yes, you, you were uh, away pretty well full term time. I did get the opportunity to go back home occasionally at half term and those good old Dan Air flights sleeping at Gatwick Airport training it all the way down there from Hertfordshire. Um, but generally, yes, you're away for a full term, uh, having to find homes at uh, week, the two weekends you got off each term. So that was always a challenge where, what to do with me. Um, but yeah, no, I was thrown in uh, right. to, to a new school with at 14 when all friendships are made. But luckily there was a group of about 20 of us from various countries from around the world. So we, we had a, an immediate support network. Fantastic. So uh, was that an all-girls school? Yes. Uh, and I, obviously, I had been at a mixed school before that, so it was very strange. Okay. Uh, very strange feeling. Um, so obviously, your parent did, did you find that your parents were very supportive of your growth and your development in whatever field that you were interested in? Yeah. I, I mean, I, in a way, I was thinking what, what their approach was. And Effectively, it sort of boils down to, to what my father always used to say was, all I owe you is an education. Uh, so clearly it was something that was felt important, um, but uh, that was all we were, <laughs> we were getting in a way, which was, thank, uh, I, I really appreciated it when I got to university because uh, I had the luxury of just going there to study when many of my friends had to uh, work, work their way to be able to afford it so I've always felt that that's like a real privilege to be able to say you're, you're getting a, an education for free uh, amazing real push in life yes so did you find that um, um, had you decided early in your schooling what you were going to go to university for and what you were going to study and what formed that uh, view well, you're, you're, you're sort of at, at younger ages driven by your parents' choices. And um, the reason myself and then my brother and sister were, we were sent to, to school in the UK is that um, we were little Spaniards. Uh, my father, being American, was very keen for us to go to university in the States. But he felt that um, with the level of English we had, we may not do well enough in the, the entrance exams. So, so that was his thinking, get us to submerge ourselves in English schooling for a few years to give us a better chance at um, entering university in, in the US. So, so that was always the trajectory we should be educated uh, in the US at, at you know, university level. I see. Okay. So uh, you did presumably your education in England till about the age of 18 and did your GCSEs or A-levels or whatever they were called at the time. Yep. GCSEs and A-levels. GC exactly yeah. right. And um, did you go to university in the States then? It was that part of the well, plan? Well, I, I, I did, did do um, the, the exams and had a few uh, good, good places. Um, but at the same time, the headmaster of my boarding school um, told me one day, you're sitting exams for the next couple of days. And basically, he'd filled in the application forms for me to do, uh, in those days, it was still joint, the Oxbridge entrance exam. 
Um, so I, I did those and uh, also uh, secured a place uh, as a result of that. Um, the difference being that uh, in the UK, you can go straight into doing an undergraduate degree in law, mm. whilst in the US, you would do a more general. Uh, so I thought, uh, given I was still a bit young, I'd try out the law bit and see if I liked it. And if I didn't, I could always re re reroute and do something else without feeling I was too old. Okay, so you where did you go? You went to Oxford or? I went to, to, to Newnham College in Cambridge. Oh, Newnham College in Cambridge, yeah, great. And all girls, uh, he, he chose, that in those days, there were three old girls choose any uh, uh, colleges, then he put my name down for all three, Newnham first, because <laughs> he knew that one was the one that maybe would last all girls for longest. And he also chose law, because I think he, he knew my father was a lawyer, so he just put that down. Um, oh, so wow. It was, so, so actually, very serendipitous. Wow. So, so it was, <laughs> yes. it was a headmaster who decided your destiny. That sounds a bit extreme, yeah. doesn't it? And it, it, it wasn't a very academically strong school because I, apparently I was the first uh, girl to get into Oxford since the war, which was wow. the early 1900s. Um, but there we go. He, he clearly could see that maybe I had some, some, some potential and it was, okay. I'm very grateful to him for that. All right, so you did um, you did law at Unum College in Cambridge, and yeah. um, how did that go? Did you enjoy it? I loved it. Um, wow, it, it was a complete new environment. Um, you felt very, pri I felt very privileged being there every time I walked through those the old buildings to to lectures and things. Yeah, uh, felt incredibly, incredibly lucky. Um, it was complete change. It was very hard to start with, so. As as with boarding school, uh, you sort of the grades started to, to to creep up as time went by. Um, but no, it was it was a, a really wonderful wonderful experience. Um, right, and great you teaching, find... great great colleagues. Uh, couldn't fault it. Fantastic. So, and did you find that you were actually passionate about law? Uh, I did. I did did enjoy it. Yeah, it was incredibly interesting and. The way it was taught was very good as well, because you were made to think about uh, problems in the context of, you know, court judgments, articles, laws that were already written. So you, you always had, they, they had a very practical approach to it, which was good because you could, you know, exercise your brain cells rather than, I never had a good memory for, um, I couldn't memorize things. I had to understand them and mm -hmm. see what was happening and then make them my own so so from that perspective it's hard you have to sort of uh, understand the concepts to be able to apply them but it, it was it really was very very interesting right so is that when you formed a projection about your future uh, at, at university or had you formed a projection before then yourself before your the intercession of your no, headmaster no life was still full of surprises so I um, was still determined that given that I was American I should try and study in the US as my father uh, intended and just to be in that country because I've never been there since my birth so I did apply for a master's degrees mm -hmm. um, and actually the, the the feedback I was getting was I was too young um, and I think the, the the college and the university in the UK said no she's not too young um, she's perfectly capable. So in the end, I did get uh, some places in, in very good uh, universities to do a master's. But as fate would have it, um, a partner at the firm I'm currently at, at Baker McKenzie, who, who knew me, came and said, why aren't you applying for a position in the London office? And I said, because I'm going to the US. But um, given that most of my, it was a there was a financial crisis at the time uh, in terms of a big you know recession and many of my colleagues weren't getting jobs I said listen just try <laughs> you never know so yes. I, I did interview and lo and behold I did get a job they, they were keen to have a, a Spanish speaker and then I had to quickly course correct in my third year and find a place at law school because you had to go do, do the law society finals uh, and, and it I was told I got the, the, the last place available, which was at the, it was then known as the City of London Polytechnic. So I came down to London for a year to do the, the finals. 
Right. So I never ended up in the States. You never which went was to the sort States. of what I assumed I would end up. <laughs> okay, so one's projections, it doesn't always come to pass, do they? No. Um, but uh, <laughs> fortuitously, sometimes very happily so. So you went... a job was not something to be sniffed at at that point. And, right. You know, with, with it being so hard, so. Right, yeah. okay. So you, you graduated at Newnham, went to work for Baker McKenzie in London, and then did you do a master's as part of your... Um, work experience uh, during that time or did you never do a master's no I, I actually after I finished my um, lost society finals of the professional exam um, I did ask for a deferral of my training contract for a couple of years because I was quite homesick in a way I felt I needed to go back and spend some time in Spain right so I enrolled in um, university there to do the law degree it's a five-year law degree uh, and I thought I'd try and get it done in two years, uh, do, do do the five years condensed in two. So the first year I did the first and second years. And the second year I tried to do third, fourth and fifth, but they only allowed me to enroll for third. There was a socialist government at the time and they changed the rules. And anyway, you couldn't. Um, so I, I, I did get three, three years uh, done. Uh, it was completely different teaching method. You went to lectures, you took notes and then you regurgitated the notes every every three months. So in a way, it was just as well. Um, I, I, I then decided, no, I'll come back to the UK and do my training contract. So right. I told, by then I also got married. So I told my husband, we're going to the UK for two years. Can we get your job to send you? And they did. <laughs> okay, I like that. Woman power. Tell your, tell your husband, you're going, we're going to England and you're coming. <laughs> get, your, get, get, get your job sorted. <laughs> Excellent. Um, oh, very good. Well, that's that's fascinating. Um, so were you at the time, obviously you were in your early 20s at this stage, did you envisage a clear career path or have dreams of what success would look like for yourself? Um, not, 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 re not really in some ways. I, I, I thought, you know, let's see what this, you know, you're so young, you're just trying something new. Um, it was the first sort of professional job, not sort of, you know, the summer jobs or the things you, you would have done during life. Mm. So it's quite serious. Um, so I just literally wanted to put my head down and understand what it was all about and uh, do the best that I could. And uh, as the years went by, um, I, I, you know, you have a clear track in, the, in law firms, which is partnership. Uh, essentially, underlying it all, I guess, was the, the 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 wish to contribute financially to my family, um, uh, make sure I could give my children uh, an education. So, mm -hmm. so I guess if you if you have a you know a clear career path, that that was what I was trying to achieve uh, in those early days is, is financial security. Right. Uh, my, my husband was in the financial sector, which in those days was incredibly volatile. Uh, so I, I I just wanted to just you know both is uh, both our jobs to, to 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 support the family right indeed well i was in the financial services industry at that time so i can totally understand yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> how volatile it was 1987 wow yeah <laughs> yes and all that so a uh, big crash um so um tell me about your career journey um when you started, you know, your training contract in London, were you always in corporate law or did you try out various things and then settle for corporate? Yeah, so the way your two-year uh, training contract, in those days, I was called an article clerk, uh, not a trainee solicitor. Yeah, this was an eight, I started in 85, so I took the job in 85. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you rotate uh, across four departments. Um, so I, I did try a, a, a couple of things. Uh, in those days, actually, there weren't that many specializations as there are today. So when I qualified, the options in terms of where I landed um, were limited. I think it was conveyancing, litigation, and corporate. So I, I went in, into corporate and immediately was given, uh, it suddenly got really, the, the, the economy ch changed and suddenly I was running two or three M&A transactions. So, um, I, I uh, did, did M&A from 87 to as an associate till 
uh, and then I became a salaried partner in, uh, a few years later in 94 uh, and an equity partner in, in 96. So I was quite um, followed the, 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 the usual path all of the time, basically underlying practice being M&A plus corporate and everything. But on, on M&A deals, you did everything. You did the tax, you did the environment, you did the employment. Those departments started sort of, those specializations started emanating as there was more of a need, more regulation, etc. cetera. Oh. But that, seemed, that sounds a very fast track to equity partnership. In um, sort of 10, 10, 12 years, you know, that's a very fast track. And presumably Baker McKenzie were smaller at that time. Um, uh, when I joined, <laughs> I think we were about uh, lawyers and professionals, uh, probably around 60 people in the office. Wow, small then in comparison uh, we were to what it is a, today. Yeah, we were already a, 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 an international law firm. I think in those days, maybe with Kudair, the only real people who thought that clients needed law, lawyers that they knew in every jurisdiction. Uh, but in London, we were, gosh, way down there size-wise. Right, yeah. But so, so that facilitated perhaps a fast track into, into partnership. But I'm not, sure you no, well, des well deserved. Well deserved. No, you, you know, you needed to to prove your financial mettle. I'm afraid. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, it no, did. No, it was hard. Extremely hard work. Um, yes. Uh, sort of people would shy away today if they. Yeah, it was extremely hard working. Yeah. It's, so to tell me no about technology. That because... So you, you, I always say no technology. You lived in the office. I think yes. one six month period. I had a Sunday afternoon off. Um, wow, on the on the deal, so it was it was it, it was very intensive, but but yeah. very interesting. I was very lucky with great clients, interesting deals. Uh, it, it just it, it it could take its toll if you weren't careful. How did you manage to um, balance, uh, if at all? Because it doesn't sound like you very much balance in terms of having a family life. You did you have children? Um, yes, I was a bit of a rebel. Um, not rebel, but surprised everyone. My, my son arrived when I was a trainee, um, oh, wow. an article clerk, and um, effectively, I, I was, I was ter technically terminated. Uh, I got a P45 as, as I walked out to go to hospital. And uh, I don't know, I just, I guess I didn't accept it in my own quiet way. I didn't kick up a fuss or anything, but a few weeks later, I just came back into the office and sat at my desk and pretended nothing had happened. It, it wasn't, I mean, there weren't any female lawyers hardly and uh, less even <laughs> having babies so early in their careers. So uh, yeah, he, that was a bit strange. And then uh, my daughter came along two years later. Um, I, I just took every day as it came, um, hoping I could, uh, you know, they could take them to school or have the nanny arrive and come into work. So you just lurch from day to day. Amazingly, I did. They were very great children, um, very supportive. Um, luckily, they were healthy. Uh, so, uh, and somehow the the support worked. And uh, my husband and I did uh, combine uh, cover as best we could. He actually had to always go in very early um, and I, I could you know, get the kids to school by 8.30 and be, uh, sorry, get the kids to school and be in the office by 8.30. He had to be in much earlier, but then he could um, yeah. finish earlier and I could stay there all night if I needed to. So um, without that help, without his support, no way I could have done it. Right. But yeah, no, you, you juggled it and the one, I'm very lucky they're wonderful kids. They, they, wow. Uh, very nice, balanced individuals. I'm, extremely lucky i'm struck by today women would not accept that the kind of behavior by your firm <laughs> to, it to wasn't them. behavior it wasn't malice yeah, it, it was it's just it, it was just it, it, people didn't norms. know what to do with it it, 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 really? it was not normal so you once it starts happening you start realizing oh we better do something about this and they did so you know the right the, you know where you're, you're sort of pushing the pushing that uh attitude by doing a good job, being a valuable member of, of, right. of, of the team and then saying, well, actually, uh, maybe for the next ones, we should deal with it differently. Okay. Okay. That's an, that's an interesting perspective. 
So HR didn't really have you. You, you didn't have. Uh, we didn't have HR. <laughs> you didn't. You didn't have. You didn't have HR. <laughs> I don't think that was. I mean, there was a. I think a partnership secretary maybe and an, an office manager who made sure we had pencils and pads. Right. <laughs> um, it, it is. <laughs> Okay, a different yeah. day and age. A different yes, day and I'm, age. I'm, I'm giving out my my ancientness. Well, no, not really. I mean, it, it is fascinating because you're not that ancient, believe me. <laughs> um, so, if you look at your career, because you you have had you know 35 years in the law, um, what do you think are were your prime highlights um, of your journey? Yeah, I mean, I always tried to so when I became a partner um, I was uh, always ready to accept offers of uh, sort of management positions so I tried to because okay. I knew the, the 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 partners needed to dedicate time to to growing the office not just by um, bringing in the work developing the associates but also making sure we were run efficiently as a business so I always had uh, as if I needed it, uh, another job on the side, training manager, recruitment partner. I even did compensation committee, which I didn't want to, but I said, well, if you don't want to do something, you should do it. Um, uh, and, and that sort of, I guess, led me to um, sitting on the management committee, but that was uh, part not not full-time role. And then eventually the, the executive committee. Um, but I guess if I, if you sort of say the sort of, three three important things professionally the first has to be surprising everyone uh with my first class honors degree <laughs> i was very much the black sheep of the of the of the, of the four lawyers at newnham um, uh -huh. so that that uh, uh, even my director studies when she called me i wasn't there it was so you know we're all a bit surprised but here you go so that was kind of a nice feeling um Lovely. obviously becoming uh, a partner was important to me, uh, just because with my, in my mind that secured uh, the family financially, at least for the for the short term. Uh, and then being elected um, by the Global Partnership to serve the firm on the executive committee, that in fact meant leaving, as you said, leaving the practice for, for four years. Um, and the third thing would be very much um, the last 10, 12 years where having come back into the profession I had to sort of rebuild myself I thought I was too young to retire um, so I started developing um, a, a focus on uh, good in fact, I looked at it as good board decision making good decision making uh, and uh, was an early voice uh, in fact in spotting the ESG trend and helping companies understand what it means uh, how it affects them um, and what they should do to address it. And, and I found, there I have found a, 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 something that uh, continues to get me up in the mornings and understanding it better, sharing what I learn. Um, right. Okay. Anchored in corporate governance, obviously, because that's my, 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 my training as a lawyer is, is, is corporate, but it, it, it's, it's very much interlinked with other things. I, li I like mixing the law with other things. Yes, <laughs> To make yes. sure I have a holistic view of, view of yeah. what, what, what companies are doing yes yes uh, I know that we've had several conversations you know particularly around the sort of I remember uh, the trust conversation that we had um, about you know what an important factor it is you know that government uh, country, um, companies who who are not building trust you know by their governance structures to do lead to all sorts of problems in their organization and then in how they're viewed in the world um, so that, that those are great achievements, really great, great highlights. Um, if I ask you to compare what perhaps you thought success would look like when you were 30 years old, as against from your, your view today, how is that different? Do you think, can you remember what uh, you thought success was going to be like for you when you were 30? Well, when I was 30, I might, I had my, um, I had two children to to educate by the time I was 28 um, or earlier, no, 28, yeah. So my, my head was down uh, four years into my career. So it was very much um, become a partner. It, it, those days, um, uh, associate salaries were still very low. So 
um, my nanny, for example, would earn more than me in, in the first few years and then similar to me. So um, having that uh, financial strength came with being a partner. So that seemed to be the ultimate goal. Uh, and then obviously it, as, as you progress and um, learn more things, you want to contribute more in some way or other. So um, to me, uh, having uh, our youngsters make it through, um, being fulfilled in their careers is important. Um, delivering to our clients what they need, so being very client focused uh, is important to me. I've always been seen as a very sort of client focused partners, and and ultimately, uh, to me, the the, the success of, of of the firm was was important. That we continued to grow, that we continued to 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 sort of drive what had created us. Um, back in the late late 40s uh, so that we, we, we continued to, 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 to have the same sort of culture, uh, global vision, uh, etc. So I've been incredibly firm centric. I've been accused of that uh, in a good way. Yes. <laughs> firm yes. first. But Everything yes. has to be in the best interest of the firm and its people. Obviously, the firm is very much the, 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 the people that make up and then the clients it serves. Yes. So, yeah, it's, it's, I get a buzz out of all that. Yeah, that, that's that's great, actually. What's interesting is that, you know, sometimes I'm coaching uh, men and women on their journey to become partners. And during that time, their main focus is to become a partner. And often they can't see beyond what happens once they have become yeah. partners. You know, it's like, OK, where, where do you draw value in your career once you've made partner you know where where is the value and I'm fascinated by some of the thoughts that you're bringing to this you know that it, it's about your clients it's about the firm uh, and it's about making a difference to the people that you're working with as well so well you're, you're given a new platform you, you it's sort of I remember that uh, thinking gosh as an associate clients are maybe a bit worried if the minute I'm a partner and and in a way, you suddenly get a role within and without the firm that you need to make the most of um, for the benefit of, of, of those you, you serve. Uh, so, so it comes with uh, a big chunk of responsibility that maybe you didn't realize, but then you start assuming it and you start getting more experience and taking on more and more, more and more responsibility. Yes. Um, but I, I seem to like, I seem to enjoy that and um, be, be focused on that. And I'm struck by the terms that you're using, you know, the people that you serve, you know, that at the end of the day, you know, one's career is not always about oneself or but it's actually the people that you're serving or the the office that you're um, that you're serving uh, and the impact that you're making. So um, thank you for doing that, really. Um, so if I ask you. Um, about your life, uh, not, so, not so much about your work, but about your life, what has surprised you most about it? Oh, I don't know, <laughs> everything. Um, no, that um, I'm still smiling, I guess. If I, I have an ability to look back and see all the wonderful things that have happened to me, um, I very quickly forget probably the ones that are more negative. I think it's a defense mechanism, a survival instinct. Um, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm just I've been extremely uh, lucky and, 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 and blessed um, uh, to be given the opportunities I, I have been given um, to, to, to do the things I've, I've been able to, to do. Um, I'm a bit of a doer, so and I, my, my my motto is don't try and build a Rolls Royce. Build, sorry, I'm not defending Rolls Royce or any other company, but you know, build a mini and then build it up to become a Rolls Royce. So just keep going and keep 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 doing things, um, right. which I, I guess means trial and error comes into play much more. But at least I feel like I, I get things done. You get uh, things done and move forward. Yes, but yeah, no, I'm just. Um, I guess I'll, uh, as and when I retire, hopefully in many years to come, I'll look back and think, oh, m m you know, it'll give me a breather to look back and see, well, what, what is it you have done well or not done well or uh, not, not have much of a breather until now, I guess. Right, right. Um, if I was to ask you on the negatives, well, not so much negative, but if you look at your life, uh, were the times where you felt that you had to compromise 
or were compromised by others uh, were silenced um, or had to negotiate your ways forward, uh, which, you know, others made you kind of have to do? Um, oh, yes. Uh, you, the, 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 the workplace was um, very undiverse, I guess is the way to put it. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it was still not that, and you, you've probably seen this as well, not that common uh, to, to, to work in the sort of jobs uh, you and I worked when we were when we were young. I mean, having said that, the, the, the four trainees that I started with, the four of us, there were two girls and, and two boys. So uh, Baker and Mackenzie were certainly keen to, you know, just take take whatever the, the, the best bunch of that, that year's crop was. Um, but no, it, you, 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 you could feel it, uh, and it's always unconscious, but uh, I, I've been uh, taking it more uh, quietly rather than aggressively. Uh, so I tend to use humor. So if I'm at a cocktail and chatting with two gentlemen and one gentleman, joins and says hello to the other two gentlemen and completely ignores me, I'll stick up my hand and say, hi, I'm here too, or something, mm -hmm. <laughs> or just introduce myself uh, and, uh, and not embarrass them. Uh, meetings, I remember meetings, you know, I was an m &A lawyer, so you'd have a meeting room full of people that all stroll in. You probably were the only woman in the room. Um, and one, one would come up to you and say, oh, mine's with coffee and two sugars. And I was the one leading the meeting that day. I'd say, "Fine, I'll get it for you, but then you can get me the next one." I take it black, rather than tell them, "Oh, you complete it. Don't you realize I'm the most senior person in the room?" I, I couldn't do that because right. I think it, it, it's it, these things. Um, you need to train people out of them rather than uh, beat them up for it. Um, so, so yes, that's that, and there's still. I think it's more generational. And I, I hope my son will never ever ever ever. <laughs> treat anyone differently um right. uh, so uh, maybe it's a, a, a generational thing that will pass yes yeah, so you, no, you were just very put, gracious put my head down and work yeah. as hard as the best you can and yeah. wish i'd been a bit louder wish i'd shown myself more but i was incredibly lucky uh, my clients uh, the clients i worked for did appreciate the work i did for them so in a way um they, they spoke for me uh, many right. times Right, very good. Well, I, I'm I'm impressed with your attitude. I, I think I was much more bullshy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a personality trait. I'm, I'm sort of more of a peacemaker. I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. I, I sort of very like quiet. A, a happy environment. <laughs> uh, very good. No raised voices. Uh, yeah. Um, I suppose I am asking you to reflect again. If you could look back uh, at things that you did or didn't do. Um, is there anything that you would do differently if you had that time again? Um, may maybe be the one thing I have sort of put my head in the sand um, about is uh, internal politics. Um, so I've not really focused that much on the sort of dynamics of how things are working. Mm -hmm. um, I just sort of, you know, if there's a job to do, there's clients to serve, people to train, a firm to grow, and, you know, we all need to band together. And I guess when you're a smaller environment, uh, when we started off, that was easier because there was a, a, a smaller group of people that you mm -hmm. all knew each other really well and could just move mm -hmm. in that direction. But as you grow bigger and bigger, um, th those sort of things uh, start creeping in and uh, I guess I'm, I'm something I've not paid much attention to. Do, 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 you know, would it have changed my life in any way? Probably not. Uh, I just sort of got on with it. Right, uh, right. And just, but, uh, I, I always look at the future of the, of, of the future generations as I keep telling you, you're my pension, so you, know, you need to do well. <laughs> not that they are, but <laughs> <laughs> I could make them feel there's a self-interest in my, my attention to them. <laughs> Very good. Um, can I ask you, um, 
about your experience at the executive level, you know, the global executive board, um, you had four years experience. I would have thought that would have given you a global perspective, not not just about the firm, but about the issues and um, matters that were coming to the board. Can you can you speak to to, to that about yeah, what your experience was like? I wouldn't I wouldn't say a global perspective, because as you can see from how I was educated, I got to know many cultures mm -hmm. um, in my in my early years and uh, as a global firm the type of work I did from the mineral to trainee I mean my first deal we were supporting actually it was the first billion plus deal in the world and we were supporting a client and I was covering the whole buying um, a business uh, across many many jurisdictions and I had the whole of Latin America to look after for example so through, through the work and then through dealing with my colleagues in many countries, uh, we, we, you do have that perspective. And obviously being in, in London, one of the uh, top financial center, the, the, the type of work is, is very global. Um, I must have, it did sort of open my eyes a lot to Asia, which I probably had less, less exposure to. So mm -hmm. did learn much more about that. And I'm hugely grateful for that. Um, but it's also, yeah, running a global business as sort of knitting together the, the various cultures and trying to understand how certain initiatives might be taken. So, uh, for example, um, I was keen to uh, introduce, uh, we, we call them in the end, global aspirational targets uh, around um, uh, for diversity. And we started with gender uh, and have then moved on to other things and and also introducing uh, different policies around diversity but then you had to be very thoughtful as to how those would be perceived in different countries how they could be implemented you can't sort of introduce something globally and say here it is go off and do it you need to do it in a way that it arrives locally and makes some sense or is doable so yes you do you do learn how to to finesse a, a lot of those things mm. Mm. But no, yeah. great, great experience. I'm extremely, extremely grateful for it. <laughs> the hardest I've ever worked, actually, even because uh, I had so much I wanted to do. It was amazing. It's sort of you yes. get onto this four year buzz that you just virtually don't sleep <laughs> to, right. to make sure you can change all the things that you feel need changing in the firm right. or developing or creating or whatever. Yeah, but uh, what a phenomenal uh, type of experience to have had. And, and obviously, you earned that opportunity and obviously you must have created and gifted to your firm a great many new initiatives that have improved the culture and improved the lives of people so that was a great service I'm sure you did I hope so certainly probably people... get a lot, of, lot done when you knew you had four years but no yes it yes. Is. I'm very very grateful to all my colleagues for yeah I'm tempted to ask you a question that that is way outside of my remit, I think, but I'm, I would be fascinated on your insight is like, um, what's your view, having worked in this multinational global perspective role and worked at an executive level in a global firm? <coughs> what's your view of the world that we're currently living in with the kind of economic and um, climate pressures that we're all under today you're obviously um, ha have attended the World Economic Forum many many times and get a view about what is going on in the world um, are we in a healthy place or are we in a very um, we're obviously in a I feel we're in a very challenged place as, as a global human family but what's your view about that what are the issues and and concerns that you have from that from your unique perspective no I think you're saying we're in a challenging uh, place is, 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 is probably an excellent word to use I mean there there's so many layers to what um, needs attention uh, obviously there's um, a big, I think, a big worry uh, of where uh, the war in Ukraine might take us. Yes. Um, how how it might 
was sort of slowly but surely escalating in some ways and what, what the outcomes of that will be. So hopefully our leaders are mindful of past history where creepy cre cre yeah. creeping up to, to then something being bigger than you ever wanted it to be. Um, obviously climate is, is, is clearly uh, something that thankfully is getting a lot of attention. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think um, regulators stepping in um, has, has been positive in some ways by uh, expecting more, more transparency, if anything, from companies who then have to do it because their stakeholders expect them to be doing things. So, but, but I think you can't just ask corporates to, 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 to fix the world. It needs to be uh, all, 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 all world stakeholders uh, doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I worry a lot about inequality, mm -hmm. um, what the past um, 10, 20 years has done to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the big differentials mm -hmm. um, in quality of life, et cetera, and in, not just, just across the world in different ways and uh, means, but I, I think that's something uh, as important, well, not as a climate is clearly, we need to save the world, but it, it is, is socially critical. Um, I worry, I mean, I, as you know, I've got um, five grandchildren, why stop at two kids and you're, 20s when you can have five grandkids in your 50s um they i wonder what world they'll be living in with technology the way it is and um the whole uh, my, the happy childhood i was talking about where we would just went downstairs and played in the garden all day making up stories now it's, it's in front of a screen and the sort of social skills interactions but you know, the, the humanity has a way of adapting to, to where it's at. And I just hope our leadership is strong enough to make sure how we embrace a lot of these things is in a way that uh, is, is positive and, and, and brings uh, good things to life rather than bad things. But then I guess we're all a bit jaded with um, who's leading us and how they're leading us and what they're motivated. Are they motivated um, by serving serving their constituents, I don't know. So yeah, it's a tricky time, but the world has gone through many tricky times over the mm -hmm. centuries. And um, I, I guess I'm an optimist and think somehow we'll find a way. I just hope we don't find that way when things have gotten really, really bad that we sort of wake up and find our way a bit earlier. Mm. Thank you. That's, that's really, uh, I really appreciate um, your views there. Um, so to close then, uh, my favorite question <laughs> what what are the three most important lessons or pieces of advice that you have garnered from your experience that you could offer to uh, other women or men even so uh, i mean i guess if you're uh, looking at it professionally um you may make your choices uh, as best you can and obviously in light of what your circumstances are but i i think i'd really suggest that you, you find a job that you want to go into every day and you may not find it first time around, it may be second time around, but it has to be something that you get up every day uh, and feel motivated and happy to do and then give it your best. Mm. There's not, no shortcuts, I don't think, unless you're really, really lucky or um, mm. really well connected. And then I, I think jump when opportunity knocks, um, to take, take, take a, a, a risk or a leap, I don't see this risks it's more of a leap of faith and trying some something new mm -hmm. um i guess throughout it all you know just uh, i try and keep smiling as best i can uh and be true to your values um hard as it may seem sometimes but um you know think think about what will keep you awake at night uh in terms of how you address things and think about wanting to have a good night's sleep so that you feel you've done things that uh, uh, are consistent with your values that's very good thank you very very much um so thank you very much b it's been a fascinating conversation i've really enjoyed uh, speaking with you so um i'm sure our listeners would really appreciate your perspectives as well thank you for having me Penny. thank you okay.